Support for Arkansas Week provided by the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, the Arkansas Times, and Little Rock Public Radio. Welcome to the show this Thanksgiving weekend. I'm Dawn Scott. We so appreciate you being here. And as so many Americans are likely enjoying their Thanksgiving Day leftovers following Thursday's holiday, a new report from the USDA finds that Arkansas ranks worst in the nation for food insecurity. The state has a prevalence of 17%. That is compared to 11.2% nationally. And joining me to discuss the challenges facing our state and feeding its residents and efforts being done to address the problem, the Arkansas Food Bank CEO, Brian Burton, is here, along with Arkansas Advocates for Children and Families Executive Director, Kisa Smith, and the Hunger Relief Alliance Development Director, Jennifer Owens Bowie. You know, last week, Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders visited the Arkansas Food Bank where she and her husband helped load supplies into boxes. And later in the day, a press release from the governor's office said that Sanders is asking cabinet secretaries to assist as her administration begins a new effort to combat the problem of food insecurity. She says the situation won't be solved solely by the government, but rather through partnerships between the public, private, and nonprofit sectors. Brian Burton, since the governor visited your facility at the Arkansas Food Bank, I want to start with you. Did you speak with uh, Governor Sanders and talk about this issue? Sure, it's her third time to visit. She's been very interested in the subject. She signed two pieces of helpful legislation this year, um, expanding access to SNAP and expanding um, uh, children on free lunches. So yeah, we discussed uh, this problem. She's very concerned about it. It's such an odious distinction. We should all be collectively humiliated and, mm -hmm. and really motivated to action because of this, because it's not necessary. It's a solvable problem. And she's right. It is public-private partnerships. We serve 33 counties and 330 agency partners. It's a collaborative effort, as your panel uh, will illustrate today. But everyone can help solve food insecurity. It's not one person's job. Well, let's just start for the purposes of, of discussion here a lot of people hear this term food insecurity but I'd love to to have like a working definition and Jennifer maybe you can can help help define for yeah, us I think the easiest way to think about food insecurity is not having the access to an adequate amount of food or not having access to healthy food mm -hmm. it is an access issue it is an um, issue of what you are near or what you are not near and the food to meet your basic needs or the basic mm -hmm. needs of your family. You know, um, I mentioned the report from the USDA placing us, you know, at the top of the list for food insecurity, but what about the cause of this problem? Kisa, let's, let's yeah. start with you. Yeah, and I mean, one of the things that I noticed about the report is that there were things that talked about the pandemic, but unfortunately, Arkansas has struggled with families having access to food and struggling with families, you know, being able to put food on the table for years. Mm -hmm. um, and some of that has to do a lot with the things that we've talked about, you know, food deserts, what are individuals able to get access to? But it also has to do with the fact that we've had a number of families that have struggled with just not making a livable wage. Mm -hmm. And so when you have multiple children in your household and you're making, you know, minimum wage or, you know, just above of that, there is a struggle that families are experiencing and trying to put food on the table. And now we factor in inflation. All of us understand that we're all feeling that um, and it makes it even harder for those families. How many families are we talking? We, we've got let's the prevalence of 17% compared to the 11.2% nationally. But in terms of the numbers of families in our state, how many is that? It's I know. Uh, yeah. it's half a million people. Mm -hmm. Wow. So just to understand this, if this if the food insecure folks were a city, it'd be two and a half times bigger than our largest city in this state. Wow. That's unbelievable. Wow. So it, it's, it's staggering and we are just, we're, we're, this is not a new problem as right. Kisa said, but 
it is something that I think we need to just wake up and realize, you know what, Arkansas is better than this. Mm -hmm. I grew up in this state. We're a generous people and we care about our neighbors and many people do a lot through private philanthropy, but the federal government solves about 80% of this problem through some form of federal nutrition program, which is why we need to talk about SNAP. For every meal the Arkansas Food Bank provides, SNAP provides 10 meals. So we need to get p more people enrolled in those programs. That was my next question. So is it just a lack of awareness that that even exists or do you know how do people contact SNAP? What do they no. do? Do they just don't, are they not aware of it? Well as this panel will um, reiterate and as Brian just said, SNAP is the largest anti-hunger program that we mm -hmm. have and many people just don't take advantage or they don't know how to take advantage of the program. There is a SNAP hotline number that you can call mm -hmm. and ask questions to see if you are eligible and um, I think that number will be on the screen but also it's an economic driver as well for our state and for our local communities for um, families in need to receive SNAP funds. And one of the main things that I always say is the average family is on SNAP or receiving SNAP benefits less than a year. This mm -hmm. is not a long-term life mm. type of assistance program. This is a short-term assistance program to help families get the food, the basic needs that they need. Well, let's share that number one more time. It's, um, it's an 800 number, 1-833-762-7275. We'll keep that up for a moment in case you watching or anyone you know may need it. What is SNAP benefits for people who may not? What, what do they provide? Well, SNAP, um, it, they, were, it, they have an EBT card and they can go to the grocery store and there are items that, that the family can purchase with that card mm -hmm. and it helps with their basic needs. It helps with the basic nutrition that a family would need. When kids are not getting their meals in schools, they have to have meals at home. Mm -hmm. And so this is allows food at home for these families. And that was my next question on children. How, mm -hmm. how many children, you say half million Arkansans, yeah. how many children? Yeah, so when we looked at it, when you look at the, the SNAP data, which most people are used to hearing the term food stamps. So that, yeah. the yeah. SNAP program, um, EBT program is food stamps. Mm -hmm. And out of our, the Arkansas families that are on food stamps in our state, 71% of them have children. Mm. So that really means that you know, it, families are trying to address uh, the problems that they have through um, utilizing government programs. But one of the things that we also know is in Arkansas, only 60, excuse me, only 66% of those individuals that are eligible are actually on food stamps, meaning that wow. there are a lot of people that are eligible to utilize these services. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, if families are listening to this, they're looking at the toll-free number yeah. put up because there are a number of Arkansans that are eligible for food stamps that have not taken advantage of it. And the national average is 82% of those that are eligible. So we're well below we're the low. national yeah. average. Again, even on Arkansans taking you know, advantage of the things that are eligible to them. Which is a simple fix, it seems. Just pick yeah. up the phone, call, get enrolled, and this will solve some of There's, the problem. There are other services as well though, yes? Absolutely. I mean, it, it, it is a beautiful uh, modern day example of volunteerism and neighbor helping neighbor. You have hundreds and hundreds of food pantries. You have five food banks that serve every uh, county of this state. Mm -hmm. And people do not need to be uh, feel embarrassed or uh, ashamed at all because it is a dignified experience. Everybody needs help every now and then. Mm -hmm. You know, we all are down on our luck. There's an illness in the family. There's a death, a divorce. And so, um, particularly this time of year, no table should be empty. Yeah. This is America. Yeah. And so, uh, it really is a, a, a wonderful uh, network. ArkansasFoodBank.org is a website that you could go to and just type in your zip code or your address. It'll show you the nearest uh, food pantry. There's probably a half a dozen and they're, they're 
great people. They're there. Many of them, most of them are volunteers. Some of them have been in your shoes before. Mm -hmm. And so I just really encourage people who do have needs. And then those who have resources, all of our organizations uh, live sort of hand to mouth these days. And so it would be great to, you know, to see the generosity come out, particularly this time of year, and see that a dollar, we can turn a dollar into five meals. I mean, that's yeah. amazing leverage. Incredible. And, so, mm -hmm. and we're all efficient. We're transparent. Charity Navigator has it at the top. So mm -hmm. I, I would encourage the public to, to let this be a, a call to action for them. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Especially this time of year when people are eager really to give. But there are two points I do want to address and one you brought up, Kisa, uh, two actually, inflation and a food desert. So let's start mm -hmm. with this food desert. So in Arkansas, a, a lot of rural areas, grocery stores are closing, which, yeah. which creates a scenario where people then don't have access to the fresh mm -hmm. produce and the healthier foods, leaving convenience stores to mm -hmm. potentially feed people. Yeah, I mean, so one of the things that we know is that 62 out of our 75 counties have been labeled as food deserts. Mm. So that is an astronomical number. And it may even surprise individuals as to what counties have been labeled that. Because the reality is that if you don't have access to a grocery store within, you know, one to two miles of where you live, mm. then that's a problem for your entire community. And sometimes we, we make assumptions, but individuals may not have transportation. So if you don't have a car, how close does your grocery store need mm -hmm. to be to you in order for you to be able to get food to your family? Otherwise, you are going to that, gro that gas station that's around the corner um, or somewhere else where you're not going to get fresh produce. You're going mm -hmm. to be buying processed food and you're probably going to be paying more for it as what well. What happens then? So what do we do to fix that? I will say Governor Hutchinson years ago um, started a food desert task force mm -hmm. and the Arkansas um, Hunger Relief Alliance, we had our second food desert summit this past year with everyone, mm -hmm. this whole panel participating and being there. And we are looking at alternative ways to correct that, whether that be mobile grocery stores, um, whether that the transportation of vans back and forth to the nearest grocery store. So work is being done on the short term and long term mm -hmm. solutions, but it doesn't happen overnight, unfortunately. And the interim food banks pitch in yes. and we do mobile distributions. Mm -hmm. There are sometimes car lines that are miles long with people in these food scarce areas that that get that food once a month. But again, that's not a long term um, solution, really. Uh, once a month, is that really sufficient for no, people? No, I, I need so. to eat more than once a month. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, as you can tell. The, the, <laughs> yeah, and, and can I also add cities and some and some states are actually looking at whether or not this is becoming such an issue that they need to start subsidizing grocery stores mm -hmm. because grocery stores are still businesses. Yeah. Yeah. And if it's not a viable yeah. business because it's a small town or a small area, then a lot of times, you know, not, not trying to lay fault at, at grocery store no, <laughs> um, but companies, but they, they look at the bottom line and they move out. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes cities and counties, local governments are going to have to start saying whether or not access, food access is such a priority that there needs to be some type of subsidy provided to these businesses to make sure. And I think so connecting they, the dots to that, that's why SNAP is so important or the food yes. stamps is right. because if more people in the communities are taking advantage of SNAP, they are shopping at the mm -hmm. local grocery store, which in turn is employing local people, people. and keeping the grocery store open. Yeah. So yeah. it's a kind of, a, it's all one holistic approach yeah. to fighting hunger. Well, the second point to this was inflation and is that affecting, uh, you oh, know, these yeah. grocery stores? <laughs> Yeah, yeah I, I think it's, I, I, you know, it's affecting everyone's bottom line. And mm -hmm. so when you do studies and you talk to individuals about what's impacting them, they're, you know, they may not understand inflation. They may not understand how to, how it goes up and down, but they understand that they're buying less with, mm -hmm. with, you know, with the, their, gr their grocery budget. And, and, and it's harder for us to source food actually right. since the pandemic and there's 40% less government help coming our way. So it is a perfect storm, but you know what? We're gonna to pull together and rise above this. It'll just take all of us working together. All of us working together being yeah. very much the key. We appreciate you all being here. Arkansas Hunger Relief Alliance Development Director, Jennifer Owens Bowie, the Arkansas Advocates for Children and Families Executive Director, Kisa Smith, and our Arkansas Food Bank CEO, Brian Burton. Thank you so much. Such an eye-opening problem and something that we definitely all need to come together to address. 
Thank you all for being here, and we'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back. Construction will begin next year on a first of its kind facility in the U.S. studying the impacts of opioids on children. The National Center for Opioid Research and Clinical Effectiveness will be built on the campus of Arkansas Children's Hospital in Little Rock. So opioids, what we know is they are not only addicting and killing adults, they are the leading cause of poisoning deaths for children age five and under. Newborns whose mothers used opioids are more likely to experience abnormal developments. The center is being built at a cost of $70 million, 50 million of that, was awarded by Attorney General Tim Griffin using state opioid settlement funds. And one day before plans for the center were announced, Griffin spoke at the Stop Overdose Summit on November 8th and explained a long-term goal he has for allocating the money that came from settlements with pharmaceutical companies that aggressively marketed their drugs. There is a paucity, a lack of research as it relates to some of the demographics, ages, individuals that are impacted by opioids. Some of them we need more research to better know how to treat and address and deal with the health outcomes. So research is important too. That's a harder one because you can't pop a research entity up in your garage. You can't just start a nonprofit and say, give me some money for research. It requires scientists, it requires infrastructure. It's a much more expensive enterprise. That's exactly what we're doing here in Central Arkansas. And joining us now with details on what's being planned is Dr. Rick Barr, the executive vice president and also chief clinical officer at Arkansas Children's Hospital. Thank you so much for being here with me today. Now you helped develop the proposal for this center. Explain what you're envisioning and the goals for this facility. Thank you for covering this important topic. This is an incredibly important research center that will enable us to study the long-term effects of opioids on child development from prenatal to adolescent ages. A comprehensive look at how uh, prenatal opioid exposure affects the developing brain, how that translates into neurodevelopment uh, at all ages, Plus, we'll look at a, a variety of different um, effects of opioids on biology, on a child's genes, their proteins, how their metabolism. In addition, we will have a uh, comprehensive toxicological center that can look for newer designer synthetic opioids that may be coming on the market. And then finally, we'll be doing a lot of outreach, uh, what we call following baby back home initiatives that will allow us to support families in a comprehensive way that may be affected by the opioid uh, epidemic. I'm curious, uh, Dr. Barr, how widespread this problem is, specifically the unintentional exposure by younger children and then also intentional abuse by older children. Yeah, we really see three ages where this occurs. First is prenatal exposure. And if a mom uses opioids during pregnancy, that infant is born addicted and goes through withdrawal after birth. And we were the uh, one of the leading centers in enrollment in a national study looking at best ways to treat that, that uh, withdrawal of an infant after birth. So there's a lot we can do there for that, that population. Uh, we do see um, toddlers that come in and it, weekly, our helicopter team, Angel One, goes after a toddler that has gotten, gotten into a parent or grandparent's prescription drugs and has an opioid overdose. And we take care of those, uh, um, those um, toddlers as well. For adolescents, we want to do prevention strategies. And we have some novel research using game-based theory to teach adolescents to avoid prescription drug, use, drug abuse. Prescription drugs are often the gateway to illicit uh, um, street drugs. And so if we can teach adolescents how to make good decisions and not uh, use prescription drugs, that will go a long way. Well, explain the research being planned and what you hope that will eventually enable this center to do. Well, as I said, 
the first focus will be to look at ways to prevent opioid withdrawal for infants that are born to that have been exposed to opioids. And then we'll, we will have a specialized research-only brain MRI where we can do MRI scans uh, on the brains of, of, of uh, um, neonates, even before they're born, prenatally, and then serial uh, brain MRIs to follow the brain development up to school age and adolescence. Um, we'll use novel biological techniques to see if there are alterations in, in the genetic code for infants that are exposed to opioids, as well as look at their protein structure and their um, metabolism. And then always being able to support uh, um, infants and their families as they go back into the community. They're often going back in very, very stressful environments. And our following baby back home initiatives have, have been shown to decrease infant mortality in premature infants. We want to translate that as well into infants that have been exposed to opioids. Hmm. You know, it's not only research I read that, or equipment and technology. You'll also be working with outreach teams, which I know is so important just to have, you know, the community involved. How will all this come together? Outreach teams are incredibly important. That's the basis of our Falling Baby Back Home, where we send a nurse and a social worker into the home environment to work with those families, to you know structure their lives such that they have a decreased uh, reliance or p possibility of misuse of opioids. And then our you know, prevention strategies, the game-based theory, will be done in the school setting. So we wanna work with the school systems to teach adolescents how to avoid use of prescription drugs, which as I mentioned, is often the gateway to use of illicit drugs. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, of course, ranks Arkansas as having the second highest dispensing rate for opioids in the nation, a very troubling number. And that mixed with extremely potent illegal drugs on the streets really creates a situation in our state where families of all backgrounds are being impacted uh, by loved ones becoming addicted. I'm curious your thoughts on where this opioid epidemic, you know, is is headed. It, we got the settlement money, but that's really just not enough. It's not enough, and, and we hope that this research center will make a significant impact. We're going to start the research before we have the building, you know, uh, really even break ground on, on the new research building that will be focused on opioid research. So we hope to make a real impact. As you said, this uh, crisis affects every demographic. It is not limited to one one population. So we really do need to, to make an impact. And we think through the, the studies we have planned that we'll be able to do that. And also to teach, uh, you know, physicians and prescribers, you know, safe um, use of opioids. That's often where it starts. And uh, I think we'll be working with a, a number of different teams to, to change that outcome. I'm curious, some of the research that you do have planned, I know I've, re I've read elsewhere that the pathways in the brain are actually interrupted and changed as a result of opioid use. And when you couple that with children being exposed, um, I'm curious what you'll be researching. But as I said, looking at the brain structure by MRI to see how those pathways are changed, you're exactly right. Uh, an infant, the brain develops so much over the first uh, couple years of life. The brain expands in size, and a lot of neural pathways are just being developed. And we'll be looking to see the effect of opioids, uh, opioid exposure, especially prenatally, on those pathways. And then over time, looking at their neurodevelopment, how are they developing, you know, are, are they acquiring the skills that they need to? We'll even be looking at uh, EEG um, waveforms to see if those are altered, and even sleep studies. Um, sleep is a really, really important part of brain development. So we'll be looking to see if opioids alter the sleep patterns of okay. infants and toddlers. It's so exciting to be on the forefront uh, of this research and, and to be the first facility in the U.S. that's doing this work. And I'm curious, though, if you think things might get worse before the benefit of yours and others' research is really realized. Well, that, that's all, that's something that concerns us as well. We, you know, we, we hope that this will will be able to make an impact immediately. Um, we, we've already um, been a national leader in opioid research to date, 
And we hope with the support from the attorney general and the state that we'll be able to make an immediate impact and start to turn this crisis around. Dr. Rick Barr, we appreciate you so much. The executive vice president and chief clinical officer at Arkansas Children's Hospital, where the National Center for Opioid Research and Clinical Effectiveness is to be built. We appreciate you. Thank you, and thank you again for covering this important topic. Thank you so much. And that concludes our Thanksgiving weekend show. Thanks so much for being here. I'm Dawn Scott, and we'll see you next time. Support for Arkansas Week provided by the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, the Arkansas Times, and Little Rock Public Radio.